Hey, Billy, you know what's awesome? What's that, man? Canon Films, yo. You bet your ass. <laughs> All right, so, you know, first, we have a special guest today, so we, yeah. uh, we're we starting to do that guest thing a little bit more often because we just have so much fun, and, you know, so I think it's going to become a regular thing. So, Gary, you want to introduce yourself? Tell us who you are, where you're from, and why you're here. Uh, my name is Gary Hill. I'm from the Cinema Beef Podcast, and um, but I, I am here because I said, hey, you know what's awesome? <laughs> this program, yo. Come on now. No, I do. I do enjoy it, though, guys. I really do. Yeah. So I've had the honor of being a guest on Gary's show a few times, and it's always a blast. He's my Legion brother. About the nicest guy on the planet. So this is going to be a lot of fun because I know he loves some cannon fields. <laughs> oh, yeah. Definitely. Uh, you know what's crazy, too? is i've heard it said and everybody can say what they want but that oh can canon films you know rah, rah, rah. dude when i started pulling a list of canon films i was like that is 100 percent of my childhood <laughs> you, you you take you can take some big budget studio stuff here and there and pepper it in but this list of movies right here is pretty much what raised me so yeah. I got nothing but but good. I mean, sure they had some duds, but man. <laughs> well, even even the ones you hold in high regard are really not good movies, but, but you still love them anyway. So yeah, I mean, but they're awesome. <laughs> so, and I think I know I, Gary. Gary and I share a love for one that really nobody should love, and you've probably never seen it, but it's it's the apple. <laughs> oh, the apple, yes. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen that one. Oh. I wow. have more of a love for, for Catherine Mary Stewart than, than the well, apple itself, you know, because she's still radially beautiful. And um yeah. yeah, that's 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 a love that won't go away, man. You know? <laughs> that's that's the one that kind of got shoved back in the corner and people are like, Don't don't even resurrect that one. But for some reason I finally discovered it. And you know me, I hate musicals. But <sighs> there's something so wrong with this one. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, we got you got you got hell gorillas dancing around, you know, and um, <laughs> sex scenes that aren't sex scenes, and not you know because I, I forget the, the the title of the song, but it's basically let's let's get down and do some business, you know. <laughs> they're not I think saying she says, that's I'm, what it is. I'm is coming, it? I'm coming for yes. you. That's yes, the name I'm of the song. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a uh, it's a treat. <laughs> Hell Gorillas, though. Hell yeah. Those, those are spectacular. And uh, <laughs> A film that had so much faith in they gave a, they gave out soundtracks at the premiere, premiere and they chucked them at the screen and tore the screen. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, that's, that's canon in a nutshell, right? But you're exactly right, Billy. These movies are our childhood. These are the things that are on HBO nonstop. And you've got a list, so yeah, let's see. Let's see what you got on the list. Well, that's what I was going to say is, you know, like back like on my other show and we've done the the, uh, the the history, the story of like the horror hosts. Right. Like back in the day and every, you know, for those, those who don't know the history of the horror hosts, those who are not, you know, the studios like Universal Studios had a vault full of movies that. Were, were on film they really couldn't do much with them except for re-release them in theaters every now and then and that was it well then as tv started really taking off then universal reached out to all these local affiliates and were like hey you can show all of our monster movies but we really suggest you have somebody that act as a host to like introduce them between commercials and that started this piece of american lore that is just and so I think too, you know, same thing. You have this studio like Canon that just has all of this, excuse the pun, Canon fodder. But then whenever like <laughs> basic cable and HBO came out and they're like, hey, we need to fill time. And Canon was like, here you go. <laughs> you know, it's the sequels to all the good movies, like the not, not as high quality sequels and a whole bunch of originals that probably wouldn't have gotten made if these other movies hadn't have been, you know, optioned. 
but here it is. And so then you have HBO and Showtime and Cinemax and USA and all these different channels showing these things in constant rotation for decades. And yeah. that's, that's where we are, you know? And so you look at some of these, and like you say, they're not necessarily good movies, but they're also great movies because they're like what the eighties was kind of, and part of the nineties was kind of built on, you know? So like, it's funny because you know when you go look for a list and it's like it's the death wish sequels <laughs> yeah <laughs> they, they didn't they didn't they didn't do the first one <laughs> but after they <laughs> but they went ahead and made charles bronson like just a, a you know a sequel machine gun you know, he was like death wish 17 you know um, okay, death wish clones uh t- yep. 10 to midnight 10 to midnight, 10 to midnight. comes to mind yeah. So, so so good though on its own but um yeah but yeah <laughs> the entire chuck norris yeah. you know and his, again, his career his was entire canon. career i mean, I mean know, min- minus the first three or four movies up to like silent rage i think but everything beyond that was canon mm-hmm. and you know the chuck norris movies are not that again they're, they're not great movies but they're they're awesome and they're fun and you know, for my money, it doesn't get any better than the end of Missing in Action when he pops up out of the out of the river with that M60 and just takes out everybody in slow motion, right? <laughs> like, who did not want to be like, like oh, I want to be Rambo? Like, man, that guy's tortured soul. Oh, I want to be Braddock. That guy's a tortured soul. <laughs> like, but here we are. Right? I, ironically, that's that's the whole thing because they said that they saw the script for Rambo being floated around. And it inspired him to write the story for <laughs> Mission in Action. And then they everybody give him crap because they're like, "You're just copying Rambo." They're like, "So?" Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not, not Turkish Rambo copy Rambo. Come on now. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Those films, the Blu-rays, those are canon films. But let me tell you, the Turkish ripoffs are spectacular. <laughs> they are. <laughs> Well, we did a whole episode on Ninja 3, The Domination. As well, you should, <laughs> yes. Yeah. That was part three of the Ninja series, and that's all canon, right. the show Kashugi. And again, growing up, going to the the you know little five and dime that my mom shopped at and having the poster section, and there was always a, a show Kashugi poster with him, you know, flying in the air with that sideways kick and a ninja yeah. star sword, you know. Like, again, so much of just being a kid in America in the 80s, you know, like I never knew what Gull and Globus meant. I just knew that whatever was on the other side of it was probably awesome. <laughs> and, and what's weird about that too, doing doing the research on it is the fact of Canon was even before Golden and Globus got involved, they bought it out. But that version, the original version did a movie called Joe mm-hmm. with uh, Peter Ball in it. Man, what a movie. And, uh, Probably flick for sure, man. <laughs> and from from there on, and then you know, Golden and Globus got their hands on it, and it just really became its own animal. <laughs> and, you know, see, anything goes. You see, Joe, <laughs> yeah. see, Joe was political, and it didn't give a crap, and it, it did it before it was trendy. So, yeah, Joe has that going for us. So check it out for sure. <laughs> yeah, if you haven't seen Joe, it's uh, even my wife was like, I. I regret that I saw that because she liked Peter Bull so much. She said at the end of that movie, she hated him so much. It's hard to look at him the same way again. <laughs> tell, don't, tell her, don't watch hardcore with George C. Scott because he's a real piece of crap in that movie too. You know? oh, yeah. So, yeah, that's, a, yeah that's, a, that's, that's a rough watch anyway, but I, I, I digress. Yeah. True. Well, uh, so Gary, what do you, I mean, what do you consider greatness out of the Canon Canon? Well, you mentioned Chuck, and you know that that's those speak for themselves. I mean, Invasion USA is, yeah. is my top Chuck in in the, the the oeuvre of canon films, and stars the great Richard Lynch, of course, is the bad guy, yeah. and Chuck kills him with a rocket launcher. He kills the bad guy in Delta Force with a rocket launcher off a motorcycle. You know, <laughs> now, if, you're, if you're a kid, you're watching that on, t- on your screen. If somebody kills somebody with a rocket launcher off of a motorcycle, you're gonna lose. I lose my mind now, and I'm 40 years old. I lose my mind now. Like, it is so crazy, but you know what? It, it happened. You know, like they're good with the dummy falls. I, I love dummy falls. They're so cheap looking. 
and they put on a yeah. Blu-ray now, and they, you can see the dummy, and you just don't care. <laughs> just don't care, man. Right. I say, I say the first ones I saw, I, I say because I was young and uh, was over the top because it is, it was a father-son thing, so it's something you watch together with with your father, and um. The kid now, the kid acting in the movie is just not awful, but you know, I, I still, I still watch it, you know, for <laughs> good old Lincoln Hawks and Bull Hurley and that guy that drinks the motor oil for no reason at all, and you know, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what is the deal with that, man? Having the having the the the, the arm press machine in his truck as he's driving oh, yeah. down the highway. <laughs> I mean, like I let. I listen to podcasts, you know, I try to like exercise my brain. This guy's got a one arm thing going on. You know? <laughs> I, need, I need that, man. That's, that's some Bruce Lee stuff right there. You know, you know, his, again, not Cameron, Bruce Lee camp, but the, those kind of calisthenics, you know, the, the small weights, you know, yeah. and uh, 2% body fat speaks for itself people. But um, yeah. yeah, the Stallone stuff. I saw Cobra when I should have saw Cobra. Of course that's there and it's awesome. Yeah. Again, Cobra and Evasion USA, both Christmas films, y'all. Don't, don't, don't right. get a switch in, you know. But yeah. the big you one, actually, I'm sorry. You had ahead. me on your show. It was me and both the Salmonses on there, and we yeah. talked about the Salmonses. That sounds funny, doesn't it? <laughs> the Salmons, the swimming upstream, yo. Come on. <laughs> but yeah, we watched, we did Invasion USA and Cobra together in the same show, and I just felt like I was 13 all over again, man. Yeah, it was fun, man. Really fun. And of course, uh, the big one, you know, when I was younger, because he was so huge, uh, was Masters of the Universe, which, you know, as a kid, seeing He-Man on screen was amazing. Seeing Skeletor on screen was amazing. Evil Lynn, you know, the whole crew, where you got no Masters in there. You kind of felt disappointed as a child, but not really disappointed <laughs> as a child, because... Really it was. Like, I was. I was six. I didn't know any bears put it that way. And I, I was older. I was disappointed. Mm-hmm. Like, I can't. I mean, like, for something as ludicrous as Masters of the Universe, because you know, at least when, because I was there at the beginning. Like, I we talked on the show about the original Masters of the Universe commercial that came out when I was like six, right? And it's like he man, he man, and it was like just that first four figures in castle gray skull right so by the time the movie came out man i had all the figures and they first when they first came out they had little comics that kind of guided the story but then later on they just let it be so you had this kind of basic idea and then you had the cartoons but even they didn't follow a straightforward plot yeah it was more character literally more character than story and so then all you needed in a movie was to put those characters in a story for an hour and a half and you would have just struck gold. And what they ended up doing was taking and turning it into like, I don't even know, like little Lord, <laughs> Lord, Lord of the Rings quest, looking for like the, the little thing to pre- play the, the notes. Right. <laughs> like there's nobody actually fighting. Um, it just kind of, it was just lame, and I was, and, and it bothered me too um, that Skeletor had eyes in his eyes. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, let me tell you, like if, if, he, had, he had eye sockets, and then he had eyes at the back of the eye sockets, and it's like, that's not cool. <laughs> if, if you haven't watched um, the Power of Grayskull doc on Netflix, it's there to watch. Uh, Langella is on there, and he goes deep into basically how he took his his part of the script. And rewrote it to his liking, because if you watch, if you, this is true. Because he's a classic, classic theater trained actor. If you watch, just watch. I, I'm sure there's a supercut somewhere of just the Langella stuff, because even as a kid, I knew he was just this, this stoic figure, he, even though he was wearing literally like a plastic thing over his face with with makeup, <laughs> and he knew it looked like shit. But you know, you know what? He put a lot of himself into that role, and. We could go for an hour talking about this, and I'm not going to. But um, the combination of that, the Alpha and the Omega, it's just so good, man. His dialogue is so good. And, of course, Meg Foster's piercing eyes. And yeah. Bill, Con- there's lots of positivity. Bill Conti's sure. score is wonderful yeah. in the film. Yeah. Um, but the Langella stuff, the fact that he threw himself so far into the role, I, I, I think we did this. We may or may have not done this on the show. It was a planned show where, you know, you know, 
classically trained actors who threw themselves into really crappy roles. <laughs> Him and Raul Julia in Street oh, Fighter, yeah. the, the, one of the greatest canon films, not a canon films. You know, <laughs> when, when Raul Julia gives that speech about, well, when you went, when Vice iterated your village, it was the worst day of your life. To me, it was Tuesday. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so gold. It's so gold. <laughs> So, isn't it Frank, funny that man. you take Fran, Frank uh, Langella and put him in the skeletal outfit and he just looks like Jack Palance? I mean, yeah, he, yeah. <laughs> he does. Uh, well, that's the thing is like, you know, I kept waiting for something awesome to happen in Masters of the Universe. Yeah. And yeah, while he was like in Skeletor's, you know, realm, wherever he was, and when he's talking about being a badass and taking over, then that's cool. But there was no sword fighting. Yeah. No. Very little. Because <laughs> you got you got yeah. that great you got that great scene with him and Blade going at it, you know, and the guy that plays Blade is actually Skeletor in the fighting scenes. So <laughs> if you read that guy's IMDB, he is a sword master, horse master, stunt stunt man, slash slash slash. The guy should sound like he's the most awesome job on the planet. This guy that played <laughs> yeah. Blade in Master of the Universe. You know? <laughs> well, the problem that the Master Universe movie had was the same problem that Superman Four had which is also canon, is they wrote the movie with a particular budget in mind, mm -hmm. and then when it come time to shoot, they cut that budget in half. Yeah. <laughs> this, this so there goes the films. half the plot you were going to put on the screen it just went out the window, and mm -hmm. that's kind of, that's, that's that's canon, man. That's how they rolled. Oh, and William yeah. Stout's uh, production design of the Eternian throne room is spectacular. It's still a sight yeah. to see, and they still say it's one of the biggest full sets that have ever been built and I, I I think all that money went on screen and forcing that one thing it went on screen <laughs> <laughs> the beautiful Eternian throne room <laughs> that was that was not wasted on Frank Langella just everything else <laughs> <laughs> oh well you know there's, the, there's a lot more though I'm sorry well you mentioned Cobra and Cobra mm -hmm. like you said watch yeah. it too young I mean Cobra was right about that that age, and I've mentioned before, like one of, like again, this is being the '80s, you know, like I had me and my friends used to play guns, you know, small town, whatever. But which I mean, kids in big towns played guns too. But man, we had arsenals of cap guns and Intertech water guns, and you know, I had this Uzi. <laughs> no lie, is so awesome, dude. If I ever see it, I've, the, the cheapest one I've seen on online was like, or on eBay was like 140 bucks, but it was a metal Uzi that it was a, a battery operated. The magazine was where the yeah. batteries went. So you pop the magazine out, put the batteries in, pop it back in. It had this little uh, servo inside of it. So whenever you pulled the trigger, it recoiled. Mm -hmm. And then it had this little thing in the top to where you could put uh, all in one oil and it would smoke after it. So you pull the trigger and it's all, <clears throat> man, with that and a transformed Megatron pistol, man, like, and then so Cobra had the little laser scope on top of his, uh, his machine gun. Oh, yeah. And uh, then I got one that had like a folding, <laughs> had a folding stock and I taped a flashlight to the top of it. And I walked around with a match sticking out of my mouth because cobra <laughs> yeah dude, hell yeah cobra was awesome and then man the dude the the bad guy was so bad i mean he was yeah. rough like he, yeah, he's um, one of the starring roles for one brian thompson who's a baddie in lots of things you know yeah he's i mean he was brutal when he's standing there like taunting him you know come get me pig blah 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 pig blah, blah. you know it's just like oh <laughs> He might be the ultimate 80s bad guy because he just, he was everything rolled into one person and looked like he meant what he was saying. Yeah, <laughs> he, he was rough. So, so good. So good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I watched one today because I had to, uh, I had to get it in because I love it so much. Can be a lot of good sword and sandal flicks. And um, one of my all time favorites is The Barbarians. And oh, yeah. If you read the history of it, it's it's directed by Ruggiero Diodato. It's got a score by Pino Pino. Um, what's um De Palma's guy? But he, he does all the De Palma stuff. Um, uh, uh, Pino something. The, the guy. Yeah. You know, I apologize to Jamie ahead of time because she's gonna slap me in the face <laughs> for this one. Well, it's me too. It's like I, should, <laughs> I can't pull it. 
Danaggio. There we go. That's the last that's the last name. And you know, of course, it has all the the Italian you know flair to it. But it stars the Barbarian Brothers. You know, yeah. fat, the, the the laugh the laugh of that film it makes you laugh every time because they sound like the tri lambs on steroids <laughs> when they do the laugh. You know. <laughs> Um, but fun sets, Richard Lynch. I wish I had a picture right about here so you guys could see what he looks like in this film. He's got like circa Chris Jericho 1990s hair going on with the, the upside pony and stuff. And uh, Michael Berryman is like his number one heavy with the with the horn on his head, and it's it's just a fun action romp. And that's that's what Ken did best was cheap sets with these. Yep. You got these two brutes. The God, the Paul brothers, one of them passed away. But um, you didn't watch them for, you know, their acting ability. You watched them because they could pick stuff up and throw it back down again. And right. <laughs> that worked for you as a kid. I loved it so much, you know. And I've probably and seen I'm... their whole their whole catalog. You know, DC Cab is not a canon film, but, you know, it should be. <laughs> but, um... I love me some DC Cab, man. <laughs> Yeah, that's where I know him from, right? I think that's mm -hmm. the first thing I ever saw him in was was DC Cab. But yeah, man, it, it can't take away since we're talking about the fantasy flicks. But you know the the Ferrigno Hercules stuff too. You know, he punched, he punched the bear in outer space and turned into constellation. I, Come on, <laughs> and that's that's the thing about canon, right? It's it's kind of like a lot of the reason I like the movies I like is because sure it may be cheap. Script may not may not be the best. Acting may be eh, but you're gonna see something that you're just not gonna see anywhere else. <laughs> you know, and I always I, the Italian films, but really Canon Canon was doing it. Too, I think that so many movies, especially now, and I know it happened it happened badly with the horror genre, but with a lot of other genres too, is it seemed like as time went on, just things started taking themselves so seriously it was like oh right. we have to have hyper realistic um costumes yep. and we have to have have like we're, we're no longer making a like you said you know like a little fantasy romp which i loved game of thrones until the last season but i mean god man it's like okay we have to literally build a time machine and go back to medieval europe in order to film a, a scene because there's you know and it was it just got so so expensive to make anything you know and so then what, when you've got that much money on the line, then whatever comes across your desk, you're like, is this really worth $60 million? I don't know, you know, but whenever, <laughs> but when you're going to crank them out for a couple mil and then make like 30 or 40, then, you know, that's a pretty good turn. Yeah. That's the new horror business model. You know, the blue, the bloom house model, as much as I, I don't, <clears throat> I'm not big on a lot of their films, but. They're, they make films for like four million dollars or six million dollars, and they churn bank, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they're they're kind of whether you like them or not, they are leading the kind of horror renaissance now. With you know, I, I think for a long time people are like, well, what's going? What's wrong? What, what's why isn't it working? And it's like because like why does everybody just keep going back to the eighties? It's like because corn syrup and corn, corn yeah. syrup and cheap masks worked yeah. <laughs> like it was it was it great cinema no was it fun and something to go do on a saturday night yes so see, see now, yeah i mean well, that's i'm sorry go ahead i said what the canon guys had down that they don't get today is they go out there and make these half a billion dollar fantasy films and sci-fi films and they expect to make money it's like blade runner 2099 they expected that to make money. They spent a lot of money into it. It's a beautiful film, but it's made for one niche audience. Yeah, and, and, exactly. and that's it. Canon had the finger on the button. They didn't spend a lot of money on, you know, they, they were hustling and they would go out there and sell, sell, sell. I mean, they're famous for, for selling stuff in Can like nobody's business and yeah. selling the distribution rights as soon as a poster was, was written up, you know. I mean, how do you, how do you not sell hey i've got a an action road flick uh that's got chuck norris and lou gossett jr in it i mean right. <laughs> you're already sold right i mean yeah yeah i'm in <laughs> um a movie studio that's just so well known like 
the the logo like <laughs> a friend of mine makes custom t-shirts and stuff and he's got he sells these beanies with the canon logo on them i was like man i need to get one of those or yeah. baseball, baseball hat because it's too hot for beanies most of the time but um <laughs> and then you know the band gunship their logo instead of a c it's a g but it's yeah. that same it's the canon logo because it's all 80s yeah. throwback and stuff so i mean we're not the only ones that were heavily affected by <laughs> by these movies i mean uh, and that's the thing for the people that are listening. If you're not familiar with the name canon, you're well familiar with the movies. I mean, and it's not all – this is the strange thing about it, right? Because we've hit some of the big hitters, right? The action flicks, the Cobras, all stuff. We didn't even got to blood sport or anything like that just yet. But you got to look at the impact, and Gary will agree with me. I'm sure you will too, but breaking and breaking too <laughs> – yeah i mean big moves <laughs> i remember when i was a kid and we'd go to the mall and there'd be kid, kids break dancing you know <laughs> like have a little boom box and they'd be up on the little platform by the fountain spinning yeah. around and doing stuff you know little dance troops and stuff and i think yeah. you know obviously it was a little it was an it was a dance trend but those movies really brought it to the mainstream and uh yeah I mean, you would see these people in other people's music videos. I mean, mm. it was it was that kind of a impact. Well, too, and they set the bar so high that whenever you actually saw real break dancers, you were like, "Come on, do the thing, <laughs> <laughs> you know, do the thing like they do in the movie." Because <laughs> which you don't you don't realize, you know, that's a neck breaker right there. Or <laughs> I've always I've always been fascinated by people who are much more coordinated than myself and. For that reason, I've always loved skate watching skateboarders, and I think uh, Tony Hawk tells a great story about Rodney Mullen, to where Rodney never went to sleep, but he would always stay up. And by the time you woke up, he'd have like twenty new tricks learned that you never heard of before. I mean, these guys yeah. were the same way. There was there, especially Shabadoo, uh, who passed yeah. away unfortunately recently. Um, last week. Last week, yeah. He um, he would go out there and and teach himself how to dance. I mean, he's from Cabrini Green in Chicago and come from nothing, obviously. And he would teach them. That's how they did things. They, they would think stuff up and then they would execute it. And that's why it's fun to watch him and, you know, his people. And he's from the, this group called the Lockers, which include Fred Rerun Berry in it. So watching watching Fred do his thing, too, on, on what's happening was, was something Absolutely. else. For, for, a bit, yeah. for a big man to do that was, was something else, you know. You could move, man. You can move, man, and um, yeah. I, I was I was compared those two, especially since I've ever heard interviews with with the varying skateboarders and break dancers, like just the way they their thought process of. I wonder if I could move my arms as such, and then do like a backflip in the air right after with the chaser. They think this stuff up, and then they execute yeah. it, and it's a magical to watch. And I'm not coordinated at all, so I've always been fascinated by guys who are much more coordinated than myself. I think that's the thing, too, when I look at, I know we're kind of getting off subject here, but, you know, when I see what's considered the, the cool dances now, and I'm just like, man, I mean, we, we grew up in the 80s. We saw the real boom of pushing your body to different limits, mm -hmm. you know, and you're doing variations of the same thing, but I think it's a problem we have at our age group because we feel like We've already seen it all. You you haven't really showed me anything that makes me go, oh, that's better than Shabadoo, you know? <laughs> you know I, I, I feel that way. Like, I remember being a kid and listening to heavy metal or whatever, and, you know, my dad would say the same thing. I mean, my, my dad was there, like, when bands that are huge were playing club shows you know he yeah. was friends with the guys from zz top you know he's a radio dj so he emceed a lot of stuff and he met people like frank zappa and you know those guys and so like i'm sitting there being like yeah you know check out like bon jovi or something and he just kind of like roll his eyes and be like you know i've seen it all there's there's right. there's what <laughs> whatever's coming up now is just a derivative of, of the greatness that was sure. well now now i'm him and i'm like yeah, yeah. well uh, so i have 
not only do I have the eighties, but I also have the seventies and sixties in, in my, in my right. camp. And so mm-hmm. now I can triple say that you suck. <laughs> <laughs> My cousin Joey, who was a diehard punk rock and uh, you know a fan, you know he he would pick on me for liking Def Leppard. He would throw a T-shirt at me and say, "Here you go, he's like you like lefties so much." Referring to Rick Allen, who has one arm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like, that's that's cold blooded, man. You know. <laughs> uh, yeah, man. I mean, one name that should always come to mind when you think of Cannon. Is Jean Claude Van Damme, man? For real. Um, I mean, again, I was surprised when I was making this list because, not that I was like surprised, but I was. The list just kept getting longer. It's yeah. like, oh, hey, hey, look at these movies from the seventies. Hey, look at these movies from the eighties. Hey, look at these movies from the nineties. I was like, wow, like, and they, they, yeah, I mean, they... yeah Captain America. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what's he gonna do? It's, it's hard to get it all in, but yeah, <laughs> Mr. Van Dam was young and flexible, and you know, again, go back to Bruce Lee. He probably had about five five percent body fat or something at this point. Ridiculous, and uh, yeah. Well, I dude, going into the nineties, you know, come, you know, Schwarzenegger had gone into the stratosphere, and, and Stallone yeah. had been there for a while, and Chuck Norris was. I mean, he was always there. I mean, he was not making as big of movies as these other guys were. But, you know, you had this huge cadre of action stars that were just... And then going into the 90s, you know, there needed to be a new crop. So then you had your martial arts guys, you know, like your Seagal and Van Damme and, you know, yeah. guys like that that are, you know, they're, again, I've, you know, Seagal was not on the, on the canon train, but he still, like... They were popping out Van Damme movies and Seagal movies, pretty much like popcorn. You know, it's just coming at you. Yeah, yep. And you had variations of different kinds of martial arts and stuff. And it was, it was, it was, it was a comet trail of that whole ninja thing floating through the eighties. So, you know, we were still obsessed with martial arts. We just started smoking. You know, <laughs> we're starting to drink beer right. behind 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 the school and stuff. You know, <laughs> but we still want to go home and watch some action flicks. And. Uh, but Van Damme, man, especially in um, both Bloodsport and, and um, Cyborg. Cyborg. And, uh, yeah. Just... Which is a film I still can't tell you the plot of. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's yeah. a great looking film and everything, yeah. but Albert Pune basically had his film taken away from him by, by the, the Cannon Boys and legit. They, they had this habit of letting John Claude Van Damme recut films to his liking. And <laughs> if, if you haven't seen, it's called Slinger, the, the Albert Pune version of the film, and it's actually available on DVD in certain places. And uh, he did that to that movie, did it to Hard Target, yeah. which somewhere in the catacombs of, of my burnt up house, I have a bootleg disc of the John Woo cut of Hard Target. It's a work print edition. It's yeah. like, a half, like a half an hour longer. It's got more Lance Henriksen in it and it's just better, and it needs to come out. You know. <laughs> uh, yeah, man, those those movies. I mean, Bloodsport was obviously that next step for all of us. I mean, like you said, you've kind of done the the full fledged action stuff with Stallone and everybody else, but I don't know, man. We it, it was it was kind of a breath of fresh air, I guess, when. Bloodsport came out, and I mean it's it's an iconic movie. I mean, look at the memes and stuff that are made off of Bloodsport. Of course. <laughs> well, and then then of course they just I mean Bloodsport just dropped in that whole Rocky Four thing, like yeah. they kill kill off uh, the animal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's like the first movie he's in where he actually has lines and talks and then and they drop him on the, on the match. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, you got Jean-Claude, who's the, the next martial arts guy. It's You go, well, he's not quite Bruce Lee, but how do you do with him? Well, you make him fight Bolo. So he's, you know, you're fighting Bruce Lee's ex-bad guy, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. 
You got Donald, Donald friggin' Gibb, the ogre in that movie. Back to the lambdas again. It's, it's, uh, right. Well, that's that's yeah. that's I meant I meant ogre, not animal. No, that's ogre. okay. Yeah. <laughs> but no, um, throw, throw animal in there too. Road <laughs> wears him up. It's all, I'll be all over that. <laughs> you hear us, Cannon? There's your new one. <laughs> right. <laughs> but then you know, again, Van Damme, iconic with the splits. I mean, that's Mortal Kombat right there. I mean, that's. Bloodsport is pretty much Mortal Kombat. That's what it is. Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, <laughs> so, some licensing aside, <laughs> they for more or less just made a video game out of Bloodsport. And oh well, of course, which is a derivative of Enter the Dragon. It all comes from Enter the Dragon. Of course, they're all but it's... retellings of that. So, but yeah, I mean, it, it's again, it just shows you the impact these movies had. If you like them or not, they were game changers and. We can sit here and make fun of canon all we want, but come on, man. These movies are somewhat legendary. A lot of them are quite legendary. And like I said, you know, like, you know, you, you get your back and forth bickering with movies that were cut or movies that were not high art. But I left high art a long time ago. You know, I would, I would rather watch Missing in Action 3 than some stupid impressionist French thing about a clown that's sad you know what I mean like for, for <laughs> you, I mean, ask, you ask so what was the movie about I don't know what do you think it was about what do you think it was about uh, no, in other words you don't know what it's about <laughs> <laughs> exactly you, made, was, you don't even know <laughs> I don't know how, how big of a fan of King of the Hill you are but remember that episode <laughs> where Bobby Hill was like had that acting coach or the com comedy coach that's like it's not yeah. funny haha -ha. <laughs> made him like dress up in a little jester suit and like yep. not tell jokes and <laughs> hank's like you're gonna get your ass kicked because that's not funny <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah uh, and again i mean you know me being that you know the first two the first two superman movies to me are the epitome of greatness as far as i'm concerned it's still the the measuring stick for all the, you know, superhero movies that comes out, and we're lucky enough that Cannon gives us part four. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Which is an oddity, yeah. to say the least. You know, <laughs> I mean, the the fact that number three did so badly that the guys that own the rights to it were happy to sell it off. <laughs> <laughs> And, and this is what you do with it, which, you know, Christopher Reeve had a lot to do with the so-called story of what was going to happen in it. They promised him a deal for another movie that he was interested in making to get him on board to do this one. That's, that's street they, smart. We actually did them together. Me, yeah. me and Lee Russell did a Beef Out the Can episode, and um, we joke on the show because Gene Hackman does the voice for Nuclear Man as well yeah. as, as, well as yeah. play, uh, Lex Luthor. We just kept saying, give me two million, give me two million. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it's it's easy to see how Canon started just uh going under. I mean, they always said, I don't know if you again I, we've brought this up before, but the documentary called Electric Boo or uh what's it called? Electric Boogaloo. Electric Boogaloo, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's the whole story of what happened with, with the whole Golden Globus canon era and it's one of the most bizarre things ever <laughs> they ended up with the rights for spider-man yeah and we're gonna make a spider-man movie but they had no idea what spider-man was they thought it was legit like a horror movie they thought it was a like swamp <laughs> thing but it's spider-man mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> and uh it just shows you they were just grabbing stuff and and yeah let's make it and you know, the story, the way the story goes is eventually it's over the top is the movie that finally broke the bank. <laughs> <laughs> they just, they paid Stallone just an outrageous amount of money to make that movie. And that's the one that kind of put them in the, in the poor house. <laughs> <laughs> it was that Terry Funk cameo that killed the poor house, man, you know. And Terry Funk, uh, legendary. <laughs> graduate of come of of, of, uh, of funk you and you know oh man again in roadhouse should have been a canon film but it wasn't uh but uh <laughs> right and that's the thing is because there's a fine line there right because there's there's movies that look and feel like 
a canon film. And then when it's not a canon film, you're like, huh, I'm kind of surprised, <laughs> you know? Well, they maybe like, outs- outsourced and stuff. <laughs> hey. Well, you know, they did, they did put their stamp on a lot of stuff too that was just, you know, that they were distributing, you know, right. as well. But Island, for the most Islander. part, Highlander, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, I mean, that's on the list right there. That was the uh, uh, Phil Hartman. No, I'm sorry, um, Phil Hartman. <laughs> no. I, I always thought that I always thought that the Highlander looked like Phil Hartman. Like they could have been. Oh, really? like, <laughs> 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 I've never even thought of that before. Yeah, Christopher uh, Lambert. Yeah. Yeah, Christopher Lambert looked like uh, Phil Hartman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you start your movie with a free birds match, I'm probably gonna watch it. That's all I'll say about, it. about Highlander. Okay. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we definitely need to need to do an old school wrestling episode sometime. <laughs> I'd love to talk about some old Memphis wrestling because when you said Terry Funk, it pretty much got me uh, wanting to talk about something that was pretty traumatic in my life. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> we'll say that for another one, Gary. Oh, yeah. You have to get Willis on. It'd be a five-hour show. Come on, guys. Oh, yeah. gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah, man, Canon. Uh, again, I just can't say it enough. I mean, I will put Ninja Three up against any action flick because there's more bang for your buck in the first in five Ninja minutes 3. of that movie. Uh, it's just insane what they piled in that thing, and just how absolutely stupid it is that it's, it's amazing. It's <laughs> it's so ridiculous. But like we 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 t- we mentioned in the episode how like. You know, you see these memes that'll talk about like the '80s uh, ideal, and you see all like this neon and you know strange shaped furniture and like it's like no, it was all paneled walls and flower prints on couches and stuff. That was a real <laughs> '80s. But then you watch Ninja Three and see how our apartment's decorated, and you're like, well, maybe <laughs> maybe there were some places that actually had that stuff. Well, the thing is, you look at that, and you're like, man, I wish I would have lived like that because she had her own video game console and all mm-hmm. that stuff. Oh, dude, yep. yeah. Her place was badass. <laughs> and then not to get... mention all the V8 you could drink, y'all. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, again, there, there's just things in that movie you're just like, it, who, yeah. who pulled the trigger on that, right? <laughs> I just, dude, just... like the, the payroll on the cops. Like, oh, yeah. Like which yeah. precinct? They're like there is a ninja at the golf course, and they send like <laughs> five hundred cops, and he kills them all. <laughs> and then the oh. next day, there's like, oh man, there's a ninja sighting, and all the cops are like, we're gonna get him. It's like, dude, he killed like five hundred of your buddies. Like, <laughs> like at what point do you put on Kevlar, right? Like, <laughs> just the fact of. We're going to have a ninja spirit possess an aerobics instructor who's also a part time Wichita lineman. I mean, it's just like, you know, how, how do you cram all this together? You're going to take her to a Chinese exorcist. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just the craziest thing. So, hey, throw Show Kasugi in there. We got a movie. See, see, now I wish Glenn Campbell was alive now to do a story song about Ninja 3. See, you know. I'm a ninja for the county. <laughs> oh. Hell yeah. yeah. Lo- love love my, uh, my canon stuff, man. And I got to give a shout out to RJ, my buddy RJ McCready, because he actually sent me a poster a while back, several years ago, actually. He sent it to me and Danny both, which is a canon poster. And it's got pictures of all your mainstays, like Van Damme, Christopher Reeve, and I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and he went through, and I think he did some autographs himself for each of these people. <laughs> just like, that's just as good as they would have signed it for real. So, <laughs> <laughs> one of these days, are gonna that person's gonna be you're gonna be on Pawn Stars, like your grandchildren. They're gonna be like, yeah, my grandpa had this. <laughs> They're gonna be like. <laughs> Yeah. That's really weird that Bo Derek's signature looks just like Christopher Reeves. I don't get it. <laughs> it's, it's perfect. It's perfect. Yeah. Oh, man. 
I, yeah. I have to go back a little bit. If you guys ever watched Street Smart, you guys really should because um, oh, yeah. it's really great performances by Christopher Reeve, uh, Academy Award nominee or winner, uh, Morgan Freeman, first role ever, uh, is Fast Black, who is a yeah. pimp that will, it will stab you with a Yoohoo bottle, okay? <laughs> you know? It's amazing. It's great. But um, I digress. Yeah, and that's the weird thing, too, because if you look in the history of canon, there's been a few films that have been nominated for, for Oscars, you know, but it wasn't Death Wish 3, you know. <laughs> I, I, I had no interest in Barfly as a child, but, you know, I watch it now, and it's, it's a great piece of work as a film. Yeah. yeah. There, was a, there was a time when I was, like, real into Bukowski, and uh, I, I, that, I mean, that lifted right off the page, just... Yeah like wow really <laughs> like this is that's amazing so it's depressing it's depressing as hell bukowski was not a very happy person but but it was really well done <laughs> it's not meant to be you know you know have a good time watch butterfly you know it's it's, a, <laughs> it's it's a character study that'll make you leave you down the dumps and uh so i since we're talking about this too i, I have to bring this one up because this is one of those movies that when you go back and revisit it, you're like, okay, this is a fun meatballs, sex rom-com kind of thing. Last American Virgin. Yep. And I forgot the ending, which is just devastating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, I mean, you, know. you just feel like, is this guy just going to drive off a bridge? Or <laughs> I mean, you know, it's really, really heartbreaking at the end. I mean, but it, it's it's funny how it just it just takes that turn all of a sudden. But the rest of the movie, it feels like Animal House or you know, <laughs> weird science. I mean, it, it's got that kind of feel to it where you know guys are getting together with chicks and it's not totally leading to escapades but they're trying their best right and then all of a sudden it just takes this dark turn at the end you're just like holy crap oh i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna quote myself uh, uh i'm gonna plug myself too we had an interview with with, with one diane franklin from the movie and yeah. other movies too and my quote to her was i, I put in the end that i met mr monison and i can see why you dumped him you know i paraphrased <laughs> myself and um yeah <laughs> Yeah, Maybe yeah, she's the heartbreaker, man. They just didn't have, have the really test scary. audiences, like the test audience where it's like, yeah, we don't like it when Rambo dies. So like <laughs> at the end of First Blood, so like, let's not have that happen, right? Let's just take him to jail. And then they make the, you know, the franchise like this one. They right. just didn't have the people that are like, hey, let's, uh, <laughs> let's well, not take. The Last American Virgin was actually a Greek film called Lemon Popsicle. It was the name of it. And they just remade it and made it an Americanized version. So, yeah, it's just, I don't know, man. It's, it's, it's one of those that if you didn't see it back in the day, you need to check it out because it's, I don't know. You end up just kind of going, holy crap. I can't believe a nonsensical teen movie can floor you at the end like that. Mm -hmm. I'll have to uh, check it out. I don't, I don't remember seeing that one. So yeah. great, great 80 soundtrack too. Yeah, I mean, it's got everything going for it. You're thinking, all right, this is going to end like fraternity vacation. It's just going to be everybody celebrating, having fun at the end. The guy gets the girl and nah. <laughs> 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 no, it's, it's more like they should have called it American reality. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of zaniness, man. You know, a guy, guy pays for her abortion, makes her breakfast brings a christmas tree they freaking dumps them in the end i was like man that's that's cold-blooded <laughs> yeah. man you know yeah it's rough man it's rough oh what about uh oh. texas chainsaw massacre 2 yeah what about just toby hooper in general when it comes to canon it's just <laughs> well the thing is i remember well i'd seen texas chainsaw massacre 2 you know a different but then whenever you compare it to the original and how just yeah stark like the original feels like a documentary almost like you're you're mm -hmm. like found footage you're you're watching something actually happening 
and then you watch part two especially the beginning with the like the backwards truck scene and like the yeah. the, the scarecrow and the dancing and the long ass and you're just like <laughs> what is going on like yeah. and it's awesome i mean it really i mean that's that's really what what gave us rob zombie i mean i'll quite honestly sure. <laughs> like yeah, rob, yeah. Zom that, rob that. zombie would be an accountant somewhere if it wasn't for texas chainsaw massacre 2 sure. but um like even though he was more highly inspired by part one his yeah dick is very part two. Oh yeah and, that, uh that. it's called toby hooper on on cocaine I mean, <laughs> He knew that when they offered him, I mean, they just offered him an ungodly amount of money to make a sequel. And he was like, look, you can't make a sequel to that movie. So you almost just kind of have to parody it, mm -hmm. which is kind of what he went for and made another classic. I, I'm not hearing Gary talk much. I don't know if he's a fan of part two or not. No, I, I like part two quite a bit. But like you said, it's a whole different animal. Even, even you hear him talk about it, he was going for comedy. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> you know, because there's such, there's such funny parts, and you know, because um, you put Dennis Hopper in anything, and he's just totally immersed himself <laughs> into the role. I am the keeper of the harvest. You know, it's, it's a, <laughs> uh, just oh man. And of, of course, you know, he goes to go test the the, the chainsaws. He needs to defeat the old That's Sawyer the clan. That's the best. And he's just freaking sawed away at that log, and that guy's just giggling his ass off, you know, like, yeah, this, <laughs> this guy's crazy, but I kind of love it, you know, and, uh, <laughs> like I said, yeah, that, op that, that opening scene, or not the opening scene, but, like, the, the college kids getting massacred uh, to, yeah. to, to, to Oingo Boingo is, um, <laughs> yep. something, something special, and Chop Top, and Kool-Aid Man flying, uh, Leatherface flying through the wall of the record station, at the radio station, and, um, that's yeah. what I call it, the Kool-Aid Man scene. Kool-Aid Man? Through, oh, yeah! yeah. <laughs> when he pops through the, the wall. Um, yeah. Great, and great, great characters, though. Everything about it, I mean, it just... He knew that he couldn't, you know, replicate anything from the first. So you think about the trend of the time, and you're starting to have a lot of dark humor in, you know, Evil Dead 2, Reanimator. This one just sits right in, the, in that box, but it's really its own thing, and it's i never get tired of watching it you know it's, it's, it's one of those that you can drop in at any time too like you don't have to watch yeah. it front to back you can watch 20 minutes of the middle and be like yeah, yeah. i was watching chainsaw 2 earlier <laughs> yeah the one the one i feel the worst for is lg though in that movie because oh you man know what? He, yeah he built, he built her a fry house man she, she should have gave him some loving for <laughs> love the face ripped his face off you know come on <laughs> i mean yeah i mean you, you take you know Savini effects at that time, which you know, it's the top of his game, right? I mean, these these effects are pretty awesome. <laughs> I think she's wearing his face at the time, though. Like she's she, like after he's, he's laying there, still alive. It's like, oh, well, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, still wearing his freaking face. And yeah. like, yeah, that's Crazy. the ultimate. That's the ultimate diss, I think, is wearing somebody's face and saying, you know what? I still don't want to be with you, though, bro. You know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean that's and like you said i mean rob zombie in uh devil's rejects i mean the scene where they put dude's face on her and she's running mm -hmm. out in front of the truck i mean yeah that's straight up texas chainsaw too oh yeah that was, that was I, one. I like to bring up life force <laughs> oh, yeah. again another, wow. fil another film i couldn't tell you the plot of no, but there's no plot. The, the, that that girl's walking naked through the whole movie about, and you know that's that's what you watch it for, and, and yeah. you know crazy skeletal people and aliens and Patrick Stewart Patrick Stewart, and stuff. yeah, <laughs> yeah, man, it's it's a neat twist. So you know, I was just on that show with Bo this over this last weekend where we were talking about vampire movies, and I wanted so much to write Life Force on my list. Yeah, you should. <laughs> it's wacky as it's, hell space space vampires i mean that's what they are and uh i don't know man i got a soft spot for that movie i mean <laughs> not because of her walking around naked which is you know well, that's a hard fantastic. spot right there you know <laughs> <laughs> i'm i'm sorry man anytime you put that in a movie that's gonna like tick a box for sure it's like <laughs> why should i watch this movie well first of all naked chicks <laughs> all right. 
like and then you got the, the thing is and you know like to, to, to segue off because this, this we we haven't we've we've talked more but we've stayed more on task with this show than we normally stay on task with, with anything <laughs> else but it's like i don't think the kids today we talked earlier it's like the kids today they should do whenever you just can go to your computer or your phone and just almost by accident see boobs like all day long then you don't understand the impact that a, right. a, a, a five second or a flash or a mirror scene in a movie made yeah. <laughs> like that was that was not a thing you know you looked in the yeah. you looked in the guidebook and you'd be like there was like the uh the again checking the boxes like is this movie any good they had the plot written here but you just look across the top and it yeah. says a v l n and you're That's like right. in is, i'm on it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, with the introduction of HBO coming into your house was the whole beginning of that because before that you had the big networks, the big three, and I mean you were not going to see it there. Yep. So yeah, <laughs> uh, first boobs I remember seeing on TV was again Silent Rage. The 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 girl at the bar kind of does a flash scene. But it was on my grandfather's TV, of all places, <laughs> which he was a pastor. <laughs> and my uncle had brought in a VHS player, right? So he brought that and he brought Lone Wolf McQuaid. <laughs> oh. And I just never forget the reaction <laughs> of my grandmother <laughs> when this big set of boobs pops up on her TV in her living room with the whole family <laughs> sitting there for Christmas or whatever it was. <laughs> well, nothing, nothing says Merry Christmas like a Chuck Norris sex montage, I'll say about that. <laughs> Which goes on forever in that movie, too. It does. It does. Oh, it's like days. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you said, you know, the first time you were, for me, it was Beastmaster, bro. The, oh, like, man. And the thing was, it was funny because we had, you know, newly minted cable TV and like my dad read that, you know, this movie was all, all adventurous and stuff. So yeah. it was set us all in for movie night and hell yeah. And yeah. then they're like, well, cover your eyes, cover your eyes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, you got bird people sucking this flesh off of skeletons and you're worried, <laughs> you're worried about a chick taking a bath. But of course, that's yeah. the that's the modern me looking back. When I was a kid, I was like, "Yeah, <laughs> I don't know right. what I'm seeing, but I, <laughs> it's cool." What's Beastmaster was so popular they showed it at school. <laughs> I went to school. It was the day when you had the substitute teacher and he rolled the TV in and he played Beastmaster, and we're going, "What?" <laughs> <laughs> so we're sitting there, and all of a sudden, here comes Tanya Roberts getting out of the stream or whatever we're just like oh yeah <laughs> she's just like oh i forgot that was in there oh <laughs> uh, yeah that's man awesome. <laughs> all right gary what's your boob story oh god just one of the guys not a canon film but probably should have been oh, yeah first pair and probably still one of the best pairs i've ever seen let's put it that way you know <laughs> All right, so now that we're complete pigs. Uh... Yeah, so you're, welcome, you know. you're welcome. Welcome to our new show, Awkward Boners, coming soon. You know. <laughs> well, when I was a teenager, that giving you something he could feel video came on MTV, and I was uh, I was smitten for an invoke. Now I'm playing, I'm, I'm playing, but yeah, pretty hot. That's, that's hot. That's what you would say, you know. It's hot. Oh. <laughs> uh... Yeah, so if you folks out there listening, if you haven't checked out any canon films, just Google it. You're going to be like, oh, yeah, I've seen Most 50% of, them. of these. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, like, and, and the one, even the ones that I didn't write down for the list, like, I'm aware of them. I just don't remember, you know, they were, they were more like maybe rom coms or different little things like that. Sure. But, but man, I was just like, this is, I mean, you take this list and montage it into a, like montage a little and, and you'd have like the perfect 80s uh yeah. tribute you know it was and again i think even, even though the 80s was you know considering you know relatively modern i mean cinema in general was still evolving 
Um, yeah. Whereas now it's pretty solid in place what things are and, you know, pretty, pretty striated, which of course now with streaming, things are kind of opening up back with like Netflix and, you know, TV shows and short movies and stuff like that. But man, back then they just used to throw something at the wall to see if it would stick, right? <laughs> and and even the ones that didn't necessarily stick still stuck, you know, because <laughs> we're talking about them now, thirty years later. So but, they didn't uh, talk about the Alan Alan Quartermain Alan Quartermain movies. <laughs> Those are a lot of fun. Yeah, there's lots. You know, yeah, we really, really get Dudikoff. Dudikoff is a thing in the can. Dudikoff. Yeah, he's yeah. in some great ones, but if I had to pick an MVP. That's not talked about, but he's in a couple of Dudikoff joints, and it's uh, the late Steve James, um, great African American martial artist. Yep. Yep. Who um no longer with us, unfortunately, but he he's in a lot of good canon stuff. He's in a lot of good other action movies too. So if you don't know who he is, you yeah. might know what his face looks like because he's been in tons of stuff. But um. Yeah. As soon as you see him, you're like, oh yeah, I know that guy. Yeah, <laughs> he's he's great, and um. Due to cops and some good stuff. Um, Avenging Force, the American Ninja series, of course. American um, Ninjas, yeah. I can't say those are all good, but the first <laughs> couple they're, are pretty solid. They're, you know? fun. they're well, fun, yes. Well, we are at a minute 35 left in the show. So any final thoughts? Um, really appreciate you coming out and hanging out and talking about some old school movies, even though we had to kind of hit them and quit them because there's so many of them to talk about. Yeah. We probably missed a lot more than we even discussed, but, you know, so many of these are just chunks of Americana and I don't think movie making is ever going to be that way again, you know? Yeah. So it's, it, it was a lot of fun to just kind of revisit these things, but um, absolutely. All right, Gary, they all know who we are because they're here with us. Tell them where they can find you and we'll sign off right afterwards oh you can find my mind in the gutter most of the time because you know i'm a lot more cursy <laughs> on my show um uh, but you can find me um we're kind of on a a forced hiatus by me right now hopefully we'll course up next week um Sympathy podcast with of course the great jamie sammons as mentioned uh suzanne and iris who's out there fight the good fight for COVID 19 so i'm not sure when she'll be yeah. back but she's um Working hard at the hospital, working on the data for the for the vaccine and stuff. So it's uh, good shit. Um, yeah, yeah. That show, two drink venom commentaries, uh, burning for Springwood, the Freddy's Nightmares thing. All those can be found on LegionPodcast.com. Uh, those Freddy's Nightmares. We, we watch bad stuff, so you don't have to. Those Freddy's Nightmares episodes. They're 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 not very <laughs> good, but they're fun to talk about with the group. But that's about it, man.